Okay, uh, so like believe it or not, like we're actually really close to midterm. Um, we're, we're in like week, week six now. Um, so we're gonna be doing a review for the midterm exam a week from today, right? So over the weekend, what I'm gonna do is send y'all a set of sample essay questions. Um, these questions will address themes that will be on the exam. They won't ask you to address specific texts. Now, the questions on the test probably will ask you probably to compare two texts to each other, right? So if you maybe take two of the sample essay questions and you're able to, you know, to answer them, you should be fine for the exam. Like, if you're able to answer them with a couple of different texts, right? So the basic format of the exam, um, I don't think either of you have taken a real exam with me before, because you've never had a class with me before at all, right? And I think the class that you were in with me, I don't believe we did a regular exam. No, we did a paper. Yeah, yeah, they're, 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 just, they're just the two papers, yeah. Because I, I couldn't figure out how to test you on anything in that class. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so the format is going to be um, three essay questions. You're going to pick one, right? I'm going to give you all blue books. You will write a 500 word essay on your chosen topic, right? I can know about the puzzle. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's probably a similar format, yeah. It's going to be like five paragraphs together, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah that, that, that's, if, if, they're, if they're, yeah, well developed paragraphs, they'll probably be about 500 words, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the second part of the exam is going to be a set of vocab terms. Um, so I'm going to give you 12, you're going to pick 8, and you're going to give me the same things you would for the vocab quiz, right? So, you know, the, the author, the relevant text, um, a brief definition, and, you know, how it you know, contributes to uh, understanding of the particular text, right? Um, all of those are going to be drawn from the vocab quizzes we've already taken, which I realize you don't have access to after you've taken them. So I will actually be going over those terms this weekend, and I'm going to call them down to a more manageable list of the concepts that I actually want to make sure that you know going forward. Um, so I should have that for you probably by Monday. And bring that with you uh, for review on Wednesday. Um, and note any questions that you have about any of the terms. In fact, maybe you know, do do the same with the uh, the sample essay questions, right? And note any questions that you have about those questions, mm -hmm. and that'll give us a starting point for a review on Wednesday. Okay. So, do either of you have any questions about the exam? Okay. Good. Do either of you have any questions about the upcoming paper? Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> She's here for yeah. She just showed me. Uh, okay. Did, did did I email you the assignment sheet? Okay, so, so, so you know, I have, I have more in my office, um, so remind me at the end of class, and I'll make sure that you, that you have it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I already know my idea that I was going to write for my paper. Uh-huh. I just ain't started yet. Mm-hmm. So, now I'm going to do that at work. When's that for me? Uh, the 22nd. Well, the proposal. The proposal is yeah. The 250 word proposal is due the 22nd. So then you you know you'll, you'll give me the proposal. I'll give you some feedback and some, some suggestions about your idea. Okay. And then you'll have another week then to uh, finish the actual paper. Papers due March 3rd. Think you said five pages. Yeah, it's a, 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 a thousand to fifteen hundred words, so it'll be roughly four or five pages double spaced. Yeah, and, and no secondary sources. And any other specific guidelines are are, are on the sheet. Now, like I said, just make, don't look like I know that I will promise this to you now. And by the time class is over, I will have forgotten that I made this promise because that's just. That's just what I'm like. 
So yeah, just make sure that make sure that I don't leave here without getting that to you. So, if you're using material that we discussed in class, mm -hmm. um, then that could be considered common knowledge. Because at least it's common knowledge to everybody who was in the room at the time we discussed it. Um, so, if you're not going too deeply into various strands of second wave feminism, you're just kind of using the basic idea, yeah. then I would say you, you don't need to cite a secondary source for that. It's like this is what second wave feminism is, mm -hmm. um, and you know if, if you if you feel better citing me because we talked about it in class, do so. But yeah, if it's common knowledge, you don't typically have to. Um, if if you were going to go any deeper than that, you would need to bring in a secondary source. Um, so let's just kind of see where your idea ends up, mm -hmm. and then we'll figure out how to handle. Um, like say maybe once we get your proposal. And if you want to get really deeply into second wave feminism, then it might be better to save some of that energy for the research paper. Yeah. Okay, any other questions about just general class stuff? Send you a PDF of yeah, it. Right? Okay. Yeah, because I said the, the friggin' bookstore still still doesn't have most of the books for this class, which is just great, um, and you know doesn't doesn't annoy the shit out of me at all. Um, so, all right. So how about we do um, we do this today, right? Um, I'll give you kind of a basic rundown of some concepts, some stuff that'll help you understand what's going on here. And then when everybody has had a chance to get through the whole poem on Monday, then we'll do more of a kind of run through of the poem itself, right? Mm -hmm. Because well, I made notes and everything on it, and I guess I missed it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well just, just make sure that you have it on Monday. <laughs> okay, so um, one of the things that I think is kind of important here is that Brathwaite is actually writing around the same time Jean Rhys is, but um, from a very different perspective, right? So Jean Rhys publishes Wide Sargasso Sea in 1966. Um, Brathwaite publishes the first poem in what he retroactively decides to call The Arrivance in 1967. So there are three poems in this sequence. And I know that the, the book that I had you purchase gives his name as Edward Brathwaite. Um, I'm going to be calling him Kamal Brathwaite because that is the name that he um, uh, chose to go by. Um, after the publication of this text, right? Um, so Ed, Edward Brathwaite was his, his birth name, and uh, he adopted the name uh, Kamal Brathwaite um, as he became uh, more involved in uh, black liberation politics. 
So, as I said, he retroactively calls this trilogy the Arrivance when it's published as, as a kind of collect, collection in 1970. But it consists of three long poems that he'd started writing much earlier. Right, so the only one that I'm asking you to read for this class is Rites of Passage from 1967. But the other two are Masks in 1968 and Islands in 1969. And each of these is meant to reflect a different aspect of Black Atlantic experience. And it's actually, it's kind of built around the three corners of the old Atlantic trade triangle. So, Rites of Passage is primarily concerned with the concept of diaspora. Um, are, either of you, uh, are either of you familiar with this term diaspora and what it means? Is there? Actually, no. It um, doesn't have anything directly to do with despair. Although despair is an emotion that is often expressed in diaspora literature. So we'll stick a pen in this for a minute and we'll come back and define it after I talk about these other two poems that you're not going to read anyway. Um, so <clears throat> Masks is concerned primarily with Africa, both with Africa before the slave trade and with attempts to return to Africa. Um, you know, it's kind of after the period of black emancipation. And Islands is concerned primarily with Brathwaite's um, own home region in the Caribbean, right? So, A diaspora, which we should try to define since the part of the poem that we're reading is primarily focused on this, um, is any population that is scattered from its geographic place of origin. And this term scattered is actually important to understanding what a diaspora is, right? So members of a diaspora don't go from their geographic, their ge place of geographic origin all to one place, right? If they're all going to the same place, then they're migrants. They're not a diaspora, it's not the same thing. So in order to be a diaspora, they have to be spread out geographically across several different regions, right? So the definition I'm going to use of diaspora is one of the most common scholarly definitions. Uh, it was formulated by a guy by the name of William Safran in 1991. Uh, I'll give you the bibliography for this next time. I just forgot to print it out. I have had a lot of meetings to attend this week and things have been weird. Um, so, <clears throat> and I'm going to preface this by saying that Safran's definition is challenged by some other scholars. Safran bases his definition on a study of the Jewish diaspora, um, and some elements of that may not apply to other ethnic or religious or cultural groups. But I think that like the basic four points that he hits um, are relevant for our purposes as well here, right? So the first thing Safran says a diaspora must have to qualify as a diaspora is a myth 
or collective memory. of their homeland. Right. <clears throat> there has to be yeah, this kind of this unifying story or this unifying memory of the homeland amongst all of these people who are spread out in different places. Right? This is the thing that links them all together. Second, a diaspora typically regards this ancestral homeland as their true home, right? As the place where they really belong. So for example, um, in uh, the Rastafarian religion that is popular in Jamaica, um, there is a view of Ethiopia as both like, you know, like the cultural point of origin and also the true home of the Rastafarians, right? That this is the place that, um, <clears throat> like, where they all, not only where they emanate from, but where they all belong and will eventually be returned to, right? There's this idea that you will be returned to this true home. And yeah, that's point number three, right? Is this commitment to the restoration of this ancestral home, right? Again, you know, the, the foundation of the, the state of Israel would actually be um, a kind of case in point, right? You know, members of the Jewish diaspora going back to this region of Palestine and settling it and forming it into um, a Jewish state, right? And finally, and perhaps most importantly, members of the diaspora share an identity that is shaped by this relationship with the ancestral homeland or the way they imagine the ancestral homeland. the way they remember it. So what we have in this first poem in this trilogy, Rites of Passage, is a look at the African diaspora from the perspective of several different individuals, some of them contemporary, some of them ancestral, and some of these voices are collective, right? So one thing to remember about this poem is that um, voices shift from section to section. Right, the person or persons who are speaking in one section are often not the same people, the same person or persons who will be speaking in the next section. Although some speakers will return. So one thing to keep track of is which voice is Brathwaite speaking in, in each section, and is it a collective voice or is it an individual voice? Now this is actually a technique that Brathwaite gets from having read T.S. Eliot. So we can see this as a kind of example of adaptation, right? Where he's taking a form that was developed by an Anglo-American poet, right? You know, um, Eliot grows up in a rich St. Louis family, right? Educated at Harvard. Uh, completes a PhD in philosophy but never defends his dissertation, uh, then you know, goes to England and becomes the most famous English language poet of the early 20th century, right? Um, have either of you ever read The Wasteland? Have you done it in other classes or? I've heard of it. 
Yeah, Kiki, you, 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 see, you, you have some memory of having read The Wasteland? Yeah, it sounds familiar. I think it was one of the times it's here. I'm not sure if it was Dr. Brian or... Um, I am Matt. Probably Dr. Waldrip or... It could have been either of them. Yeah, yeah. You, if, if you took Britlet too with any of us, you probably would have read The Wasteland. Um, in part because it's, you know, if you study British literature in the 20th century, it's an impossible poem to avoid. It's one of those that's so influential that everybody kind of has to reckon with it. Um, so, Eliot is essentially kind of like describing the situation of Europe after the First World War, right? And to him, it does not look good. Europe looks to him like a sterile wasteland um, that is impossible, that uh, is incapable of creating anything new. So the only thing he can do is cobble together fragments of elements of high and popular culture, right? So, this, so the poem quotes Shakespeare, it quotes Dante, it quotes you know, the ancient Greek and Roman epics. Um, he quotes uh, Richard Wagner's Ring Cycle of Operas. Um, quotes popular music hall songs and conversations he heard in bars. So it's written in a variety of voices and with a rhythm that is influenced by jazz. and ends with a riff on Hindu philosophy. So this is, um, this is appropriation from the other direction, right, that we were talking about earlier in class. So it's not um, a poet from a minority group adapting materials from the majority culture to his or her situation like we saw um, you know, Chinu Achebe doing, right? This is the, in some ways, kind of like the more, um, the more objectionable form of appropriation where you have um, a poet from the majority culture uh, swiping things from minority cultures in order to shore up kind of his own kind of so social or cultural position, right? But this does, provide fertile ground for later poets like Brathwaite, who are looking for a way out of the traditional British verse trap. And I want to point to that um, essay that I sent to you all on nation language um, to uh, <clears throat> demonstrate kind of what like how Brathwaite imagines himself to it, or why he feels there's a need to do this. So if we turn to page 86, uh, look at page 863 here. So, <clears throat> in the Caribbean, as in South Africa, and in any area of cultural imperialism for that matter, the educational system did not recognize the presence of these various languages. What our educational system did was to recognize and maintain the language of the conquistador, the language of the planter, the language of the official, the language of the Anglican preacher. It insisted that not only would English be spoken in the Anglophone Caribbean, but that the educational system would carry the contours of an English heritage. Hence, as Dennis said, Shakespeare, George Eliot, Jane Austen, British literature and literary forms, the models that were intimate to Great Britain, that had very little to do really with the environment and the reality of the Caribbean, were dominant in the Caribbean educational system. People were forced to learn things that had no relevance to themselves. Paradoxically, in the Caribbean, as in many other cultural disaster areas, the people educated in this system came to know more, even today, about English kings and queens than they do about our own national heroes, our own slave rebels, 
the people who helped to build and to destroy our society. We are more excited by English literary models, by the concept of, say, Sherwood Forest and Robin Hood, than we are by Nanny of the Maroons, a name some of us didn't even know until a few years ago. And in terms of what we write, our perceptual models, we are more conscious in terms of sensibility of the falling of snow, for instance, the models are all there for the falling of the snow, than of the force of the hurricanes that take place every year. In other words, we haven't got the syllables, the syllabic intelligence to describe the hurricane, which is our own experience, whereas we can describe the imported alien experience of the snowfall. It is that kind of situation that we are in. So how do we break this down? So how, what, what is Brathwaite arguing the situation of the Anglophone Caribbean poet is? Like, what's the dilemma? some with wide sargasso C as well, right? Like, can you actually describe the experience of, you know, say, you know, Jamaica or Dominica or Barbados or Trinidad by using English literary and linguistic models? I mean, think about the experience that um, Antoinette's husband has in Dominica, right? Where he, he's overwhelmed by everything he sees and does not, does not have the words to describe much of it, right? Because it's outside of his experience. So if you're going to school and you're just being, you're being fed Wordsworth and you're being fed Shakespeare and you're being fed George Eliot and T.S. Eliot, right? How close are these models going to be to your own day-to-day -day life? And do they give you a model for writing about your own day-to-day -day life? I mean, Shakespeare is like tragedy in a way. He's trying to make his <laughs> stuff like tragedy. Sure. And, and, and you know, we, we try to make the argument that you know we can we continue to teach Shakespeare because it's in some way universal, right? But it's really it's really not, right? Yeah, the shelf Shakespeare now through. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think this is one of the things we talked about in 2150, right? Is how the the Shakespeare thing is kind of an accident of history. Um, but um, you know the point the you know, the point I'm trying to make here is that Shakespeare is a product of a particular time and place and particular cultural movements that are specific to that place. And you can't just kind of like transfer Shakespeare's poetic language, you know, the meter he writes the sonnets in, for example, to describe completely other kinds of experience, right? So in England, for example, they typically don't have hurricanes, right? I mean, you know, it rains a lot, but it's, you know, it, it's basically just kind of cold and wet all the time, right? However, if you live in Dominica or Jamaica, oh yeah, the hurricanes happen, yeah, hurricanes happen an awful lot, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And, you know, so this is one of the, part of the point that Brathwaite is trying to make here, right, is that the, the gentler rhythms of English poetry can't capture the, vi the violence of Caribbean experience, either of slavery and colonization, or 
even of you know weather and environment, right? Like he's kind of you know, just using hurricane maybe more as a metaphor, right? <clears throat> but yeah, if you're you know using a syllabic system that's based on you know the gentle falling of rain or you know the you know patterns of snow. Um, yeah, it, it's hard to express the gale force of a hurricane in that. Okay. And so what he's arguing for is the development of some kind of alternative means of you know, kind of providing rhythm in poetry. And I think one of the things that he's doing in this trilogy is like, like Eliot, he's finding those rhythms in popular music. He's finding it in, you know, particularly in the rhythms of black popular music traditions, like jazz, like blues, calypso, um, even reggae, right? Where's calypso? What's that? Where's calypso? Calypso is, um, it's a particular form of um, Caribbean folk music. Um, it is... Like, have you ever heard of, like, a steel drum band? Like, like, like people play, playing, uh, you know, uh, these... It's like a round steel canister, they hit it with mallets, and each little bump on the canister kind of produces a different note. I think of the Blue Man. Uh, okay, yeah, it's, it's, it's not like the Blue Man group. Like, I, you know what, um, I, I don't really know how to describe it for you, but next time I will play some for you and that might help it make a little bit more sense. But yeah, suffice to say, it's, uh, Calypso is a form of Caribbean folk music. So it, it's, 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 it comes out of a popular tradition rather than like a, um, a learned highbrow tradition, right? Mm -hmm. But most of the forms that Brathwaite is a you know, like, you know, Brathwaite is himself a learned highbrow, right? You know, he's a guy with, a, you know, he's a professional historian with a master's degree. Uh, who worked for a while for you know Ghana's Department of Education, uh, trying to modernize their educational system, um, but he's drawing on these popular traditions. Um, actually, like in much the same way, the late nineteenth and early, the late eighteenth and early nineteenth century Romantics were drawing on folk poetry and folk ballads uh, to produce their poetry. He's just adapting that same method to a different. Um, okay, so any questions so far? Everybody with me? Okay, so and um, is this helping any of the parts that you have read so far make a little more sense? Yeah. Okay. Especially when you said about how he uh, switched like perspectives of like different people. Yeah, yeah. Kind of say that a little bit. Yeah, it it it, it sometimes it takes. Uh, you know, the, fir uh, the first time I read this with no context, it took me, you know, about halfway through the first half of Rites of Passage to figure out, oh, these are different voices speaking, these are different people. Um, but yeah, um, yeah. Well, once once you figure out that the perspectives, and the language sometimes shifts with the different perspectives too. Um, like the, uh, the the last poem that I had to read for today, or the last section I had to read for the day, Wings of the Dove. Um, is from the perspective of a Jamaican Rastafarian. Um, you know, some of the other <clears throat> sections are from the perspective of a guy who's referred to as, as Uncle Tom. And I believe, like, we, we, you know, we all know what the phrase Uncle Tom means, right? I heard that it's not, it doesn't mean what we think it means, like, it means uh -huh. the opposite, actually. Because I heard, I'm not sure actually it is, but, like, the actual Uncle Tom was actually, like, um, was, I guess, funny. <laughs> like, more like an ally rather than, like, I don't know how to explain it. Okay. I'm talking about Uncle Tom, uh -huh. meaning in a negative way. Yeah. yeah. The things he, the person actually did or whatever. Yeah. Like, well, it, it, it doesn't, like, the, the origin of the term isn't with a real person. It's with a character in a novel, right, by a white right. abolitionist named Harriet Beecher Stowe. The novel's called Uncle Tom's Cabin. And the character of Uncle Tom in that novel is basically, um, 
I think the reason he's, he's criticized is that he's largely a kind of victim with, no, with not much agency in the novel, right? He's somebody who just continues to be, you know, good and relatively saintly um, despite all of the shit that white people pile on him. Um, and I think that's probably where it shades into the negative connotations of the term Uncle Tom today, right? Is somebody who's just going to kind of put up with all of white, you know, all of the shit that white people put on them um, with a smile and um, try to conform as much as they can um, to white society. Um, but one of the things that Brathwaite is doing is giving this character a voice and critiquing that term from within, right? So this is something to track as you're looking back at this. Because um, this is a character that pops up several times in Rites of Passage. Um, and he's kind of dismayed by the way his descendants think of him, right? So he's clearly like depicted as a kind of ancestor figure. Um, and one thing that might be helpful is to think of ancestors in this regard as well as kind of similar to what Achebe was doing in Things Fall Apart, right? You know, where ancestors continue to have a role in the life of the community even long after they're dead. Okay, so there was something else that I wanted to make sure I covered with y'all. Um, two other things I wanted to make sure I covered with y'all. Um, and now I'm trying to replay, I'm trying to remember what it was I wanted to do. Okay, uh, so another thing to keep track of when reading Brathwaite, um, he likes puns and he likes inventing new words with ambiguous loaded meanings, right? So if we look, for example, at the title of Rites of Passage. You would think this, like, path, like the pathway to passage of rites, something like this. Um, it's like, uh -huh. I cannot remember right now. Yeah. But you would think it's like, oh, this is the build up of how adolescents go through, like, Sweet 16. Exactly, like, yeah, yeah. We, we, 21. Yeah, we think of, like, Rites of Passage, these kind of, like, initiate, initiation moments into adult society and things like that, right? Although we usually spell that differently, right? It's usually R-I-T-E-S, like rituals, rather than rites, like R-I-G-H-T-S, right? When we talk about rites, when we spell it this way, what do we usually mean by rites? This is your rights. Like, there's your rights and there's your wrongs. You have to try to go to the pathway of the right that will take you to the end bill, basically. Uh-huh, okay. And that is that is one way, yeah. That like like right is incorrect, right? But I think what the meaning that Brathwaite is playing with here instead is like rights in terms of like things that the government owes you, right? Like civil, like your civil. Rights. Exactly, more like yeah, like 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 your like your civil or social rights, right? So you know, freedom of speech, freedom of movements, you know, freedom of association, freedom of religion, things like that, right? So yeah, so it's here kind of like more in the context of citizenship. But the word passage here is also intended to evoke the middle passage of the transatlantic trade triangle. And thus, the denial of the rights and the denial of you know, citizenship, the denial of civil liberties um, to those Africans who were captured as slaves and brought over to the Americas, right? So <clears throat> on the one hand, yeah, like, like this is referencing the idea of initiation into society but it's initiation into a society that already regards, regards you as unequal. Um, and if, you, if you're, you're, in your point of origin into this society um, is um, involuntary and difficult. Now, <clears throat> in terms
terms of kind of coining new terms, even the phrase that he uses to describe the whole tri trilogy, the arrivance, I think is one that we might want to take a minute uh, to unpack um, because it is, uh, it's relevant, I think, to the way um, Brathwaite understands and describes um, Black Atlantic experience. So let's kind of think about this word arrivant for a second. What's the obvious root word of arrivant? Arrive. Arrive, yeah. And what does it mean to arrive someplace? <laughs> to yeah, show, show up, up. yeah. <laughs> I've, I've arrived, I've showed up, right? Yeah. I'm here. Outside. Yeah, so basically show up at the door. Yeah. <laughs> With some heads up sometimes. Okay. So, if you're using this term then to describe a person, and so an immigrant is what? What's an immigrant? person that comes from another, uh, another country or... Yeah. And then they, they, yeah, that's someone who comes from one place and settles in another, right? Mm -hmm. um, and an emigrant then is the opposite, right? A per, an, an, emigrant is a per, an immigrant is a person who comes to a place, an emigrant is a person who leaves the place. So it's a matter of perspective, right? Mm -hmm. So, if you're an arrivant, right? If you're a person that's sh that shows up, it sounds like you're unwanted. Like you're unwanted because they don't even consider you an immigrant. You're just arriving. Yeah. Yeah. Like the, the immigrant settles into a new place. The arrivant just shows up, right? So yeah, it's, it's, it's this this kind of it, there's a sense of rootlessness that Brathwaite is trying to convey with this word, right? Right, the arriving is rootless and not placeness, placeless. And is, constant, is defined more by movement than by anything else. I'm going to give you today. I'm going to give you a little bit of, kind of Gilroy's rundown. Um, I'll give you the bibliographical reference for this next time, and then we'll I'll give you the reading questions, and we'll talk about the whole poem on Monday. So Gilroy, in 1993, writes a hugely influential book called The Black Atlantic. Is complex, is complex and nuanced and very smart. Um, and I do not have time to break the whole thing down. So I'm just going to give you the major highlights. And you know, this is something that you can, you know, that this is a book that you can certainly look up um, if you want more of this. So Gilroy first argues that the Black Atlantic. is a space of transnational cultural construction, right? In part, because the nations that were native to the Caribbean no longer exist, right? By and large, the native population of the islands um, are killed off 
uh, by slavery and by European diseases. So the populations that now inhabit this place are, it's, it's basically a kind of multicultural settler population, right? You have the Europeans who came as planters and often slavers. You have um, Africans who were brought over as slaves. And then once slavery was abolished, you have um, South Asians who were brought over as cheap labor. So <clears throat> Gilroy sees this as a kind of like relatively unique space of kind of like almost like transnational hybrid social identity, right? And it's defined for him by a kind of double consciousness, right? Where the political formations and official institutions of most of the Caribbean nations remain European, right? You know, they have European style parliaments, their educational systems are still built on um, European models. And you know, in many of them, at least officially, European religions are practiced, right? So the institutions tend to be Europe-derived. But with a strong awareness of African cultural groups. And Gilroy's central thesis, I think, is that culture is formed primarily through cross-cultural and cross-class movements and exchange, right? So this is a place that's defined by diaspora, and that is defined by exchange of ideas and values, um, sometimes voluntarily, sometimes forcibly, across cultures. And so I want you to think about Gilroy's model of the Black Atlantic as you are reading the rest of Brathwaite's poem here. So, do y'all have any questions about any of this? Is there anything that seems confusing or unclear or that you'd like me to go back over?